War and Peace, Book Nine, Chapter Eleven, Read for LibriVox.org by Julie van Wallichem. Prince Andrew's eyes were still following Pfuel out of the room when Count Bennigsen entered hurriedly, and nodding to Bolgonski but not pausing, went into the study, giving instructions to his adjutant as he went. The Emperor was following him, and Bennigsen had hastened on to make some preparations and to be ready to receive the sovereign. Chernyshov and Prince Andrew went out into the porch, where the Emperor, who looked fatigued, was dismounting. Marcus Palucci was talking to him with particular warmth, and the Emperor, with his head bent to the left, was listening with a dissatisfied air. The Emperor moved forward, evidently wishing to end the conversation, but the flushed and excited Italian, oblivious of decorum, followed him, and continued to speak. "'And as for the man who advised forming this camp, the dresser camp,' said Paolucci, as the emperor mounted the steps, and noticing Prince Andrew, scanned his unfamiliar face, "'as to that person, sire,' continued Paolucci, desperately, apparently unable to restrain himself, "'the man who advised the dresser camp, I see no alternative but the lunatic asylum or the gallows.' Without heeding the end of the Italian's remarks, and as if though not hearing them, the Emperor, recognizing Bolgonski, addressed him graciously. "'I am very glad to see you. Go in there, where they are meeting, and wait for me.' The Emperor went into the study. He was followed by Prince Peter Mikhailovich Volkonsky and Baron Stein, and the door closed behind them. Prince Andrew, taking advantage of the Emperor's permission, accompanied Paolucci, whom he had known in Turkey, into the drawing-room where the council was assembled. Prince Peter Mykolovich Volkonsky occupied the position, as it were, of chief of the Emperor's staff. He came out of the study into the drawing-room with some maps which he spread on the table, and put questions on which he wished to hear the opinion of the gentlemen present. What had happened was that news, which afterwards proved to be false, had been received during the night of a movement by the French to outflank the Drissa camp. The first to speak was General Armfeld, who, to meet the difficulty that presented itself, unexpectedly proposed a perfectly new position away from the Petersburg and Moscow roads. The reason for this was inexplicable, unless he wished to show that he, too, could have an opinion. But he urged that at this point the army should unite and there await the enemy. It was plain that Armfeld had thought out that plan long ago, and now expounded it not so much to answer the questions put, which, in fact, his plan did not answer, as to avail himself of the opportunity to air it. It was one of the millions of proposal, one as good as another, that could be made as long as it was quite unknown what character the war would take. Some disputed his arguments, others defended them. Young Count Toll objected to the Swedish general's views more warmly than anyone else, and in the course of the dispute drew from his side pocket a well-filled notebook, which he asked permission to read to them. In these voluminous notes Toll suggested another scheme, totally different from Armfeld's of Fuel's plan of campaign. In answer to Toll, Paolici suggested an advance and an attack, which, he urged, could alone extricate us from the present uncertainty and from the trap, as he called the Drissa camp, in which we were situated. During all these discussions, Pfuel and his interpreter, Volzogen, his bridge in court relations, were silent. Pfuel only snorted contemptuously and turned away, to show that he would never demean himself by replying to such nonsense as he was now hearing. So, when Prince Volkonsky, who was in the chair, called on him to give his opinion, he merely said, "'Why ask me? General Armfels has proposed a splendid position with an exposed rear. Why not this Italian gentleman's attack? Very fine, or a retreat, also good. Why ask me?' said he. "'Why, you yourself know everything better than I do.' But when Volkonsky said, with a frown, that it was in the Emperor's name that he asked his opinion, Phil rose, and, suddenly growing animated, began to speak. "'Everything has been spoiled, everything muddled, everybody thought they knew better than I did, and now you come to me. How mend matters? There is nothing to mend. 
"'The principles laid down by me must be strictly adhered to,' said he, drumming on the table with his bony fingers. "'What is the difficulty? A nonsense! Childishness!' He went up to the map, and, speaking rapidly, began proving that no eventuality could alter the efficiency of the dresser camp, that everything had been foreseen, and that if the enemy were really going to outflank it, the enemy would inevitably be destroyed. Paolucci, who did not know German, began questioning him in French. Volzogen came to the assistance of his chief, who spoke French badly, and began translating for him, hardly able to keep pace with the fuel, who was rapidly demonstrating that not only all that had happened, but all that could happen, had been foreseen in a scheme, and that if there were now any difficulties, the whole fault lay in the fact that his plan had not been precisely executed. He kept laughing sarcastically, he demonstrated, and at last contemptuously ceased to demonstrate, like a mathematician who ceases to prove in various ways the accuracy of a problem that has already been proved. Volzogen took his place and continued to explain his views in French, every now and then turning to Fuel and saying, "'Is it not so, Your Excellency?' But Fuel, like a man heated in a fight who strikes those on his own side, shouted angrily at his own supporter, Volzogen, "'Well, of course! What more is it there to explain?' Paolucci and Michaud both attacked Volzogen simultaneously in French. Arnfeld addressed Fuel in German. Toll explained to Volkonsky in Russian. Prince Andrew listened and observed in silence. Of all these men, Prince Andrew sympathized most with Fuel, angry, determined, and absurdly self-confident as he was. Of all those present, evidently he alone was not seeking anything for himself— nursed no hatred against anyone, and only desired that a plan, formed on a theory arrived at by years of toil, should be carried out. He was ridiculous and unpleasantly sarcastic, but yet he inspired involuntary respect by his boundless devotion to an idea. Besides this, three marks of all except few had one common trait that had not been noticeable at the Council of War in 1805. There was now a panic fear of Napoleon's genius, which, though concealed, was noticeable in every rejoinder. Everything was assumed to be possible for Napoleon. They expected him from every side, and invoked his terrible name to shatter each other's proposals. Fuel alone seemed to consider Napoleon a barbarian, like everyone else who opposes his theory. But besides this feeling of respect, Fuel evoked pity— in Prince Andrew, from the tone in which the courtiers addressed him, and the way Paolucci had allowed himself to speak of him to the Emperor, but above all from a certain desperation of Fuel's own expressions. It was clear that the others knew, and Fuel himself felt, that his fall was at hand, and despite his self-confidence and grumpy German sarcasm, he was pitiable, with his hair smoothly brushed on the temples and sticking up in tufts behind. So he concealed the factor in a show of irritation and contempt. He was evidently in despair that the sole remaining chance of verifying his theory by a huge experiment, and proving its soundness to the whole world, was slipping away from him. The discussions continued a long time, and the longer they lasted, the more heated became the dispute, culminating in shouts and personalities, and the less was it possible to arrive at any general conclusion from all that had been said. Prince Andrew, listening to this polyglot talk, and to the surmises, plans, refutations, and shouts, felt nothing but amazement at what they were saying. A thought that had long since and often occurred to him during his military activities, the idea that there is not and cannot be any signs of war, and that therefore there can be no such a thing as a military genius, now appeared to him an obvious truth. What theory and science is possible about a matter, the conditions and circumstances of which are unknown and cannot be defined, especially when the strength of the acting forces cannot be ascertained? No one was or is able to foresee in what condition our or the enemy's armies will be in a day's time, and no one can gauge the force of this or that detachment. Sometimes, when there is not a coward at the front to shout, we are cut off and start running, 
but a brave and jolly lad who shouts hurrah a detachment of five thousand is worth thirty thousand as a churngraben while at times fifty thousand run from eighty thousand as at austerlitz what science can there be in a matter in which as in all practical matters nothing can be defined and everything depends on innumerable conditions the significance of which is determined at a particular moment which arrives no one knows when Arnfield says our army is cut in half and paolucci says we have got the french army between two fires michaud says that the worthlessness of the dresser camp lies in having the river behind it and Field says that is what constitutes its strength toll proposes one plan Arnfield another and they are all good and all bad, and the advantages of any suggestions can be seen only at the moment of trial. And why do they all speak of a military genius? Is a man a genius who can order bread to be brought up at the right time, and say who is to go to the right and who to the left? It is only because military men are invested with pomp and power, and crowds of sycophants flatter power, attributing to it qualities of genius it does not possess. The best generals I have known were, on the contrary, stupid or absent-minded men. Bagration was the best, Napoleon himself admitted that, and of Bonaparte himself. I remember his limited, self-satisfied face on the field of Austerlitz. Not only does a good army commander not need any special qualities, on the contrary, he needs the absence of the highest and best human attributes, love, poetry, tenderness, and philosophic inquiring doubt. He should be limited, firmly convinced that what he is doing is very important, otherwise he will not have sufficient patience, and only then will he be a brave leader. God forbid that he should be human, should love or pity, or think of what is just and unjust. It is understandable that the theory of their genius was invented for them long ago because they have power. The success of a military action depends not on them, but on the man in the ranks who shouts, We are lost, or who shouts, Hurrah! And only in the ranks can one serve with assurance of being useful. So thought Prince Andrew as he listened to the talking, and he roused himself only when Paolucci called him and everyone was leaving. At a review next day, the Emperor asked Prince Andrew where he would like to serve, and Prince Andrew lost his standing in court circles forever, by not asking to remain attached to the sovereign's person, but for permission to serve in the army. End of chapter 11 This recording is in the public domain.